Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study of Riverside Baptist Church. We're finally coming to the end of the saga in regards to uh, Esther, Mordecai, and Haman. Well, Haman's saga ended last week with uh, our story of him and him hanging from the gallows. So Haman's story is over, but there's a problem. Haman initiated something months ago that now is coming to fruition, and the Jews are going to have to be confronted with this edict uh, to put them to death. If you recall, back in chapter 3, uh, Haman had convinced the king to establish an edict that on the 13th of the month of Adar, which was the last month of the year, uh, 11 months later, uh, all of the Jews would be put to death by at the hands of the Persians and Medes and those in the uh, provinces where the Jews were living. Nothing could be done about that. Uh, the edict, even though Haman is dead, the edict has been signed by the king and the law of the Medes and the Persians is stuck in, in, in stone, as it were, and even the king couldn't change it. But we're going to look and see how God brought it about. Let's look at Esther chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 4, as we try to get a running start for our uh, lesson this evening. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the king, or the enemies of the Jews, had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought to destroy and harm them. No one could withstand them, because the fear of God fell upon all the people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all of those doing the king's work, helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai was great in the king's palace. And his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai, became in, uh, increasingly prominent. Father, we thank you for the lessons that we've learned from Esther, uh, for this rich book that has... Uh, enabled us to see your hand at work in so many ways. Now help us tonight as we look once again in your word in this final uh, few verses uh, in the book of Esther and, and see how you worked everything out just so perfectly as we look at the Holocaust being averted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, the Holocaust has been averted. And part of that is because retaliation was sanctioned. Uh, the stage was set 11 months ago, as we said earlier, in the month Nisan, when Haman came, this is in chapter 3, came before the king, convinced the king. There were people that were trying to uh, avert his authority and, and subvert his authority. And so the king signed the order that all of the Jews would be put to death uh, at the hands of the Medes and Persians and others living in the province. The date was established 11 months later in the month Adar, the last month of the year, on the 13th day of the month. The tables had been set, the stage had been set, but then the tables were turned. In this passage in chapter 9, uh, Mordecai, just in, in chapter 8, just a little bit ahead of that, had uh, decreed that the Jews could defend themselves. See, up to this point, the Jews couldn't defend themselves. They couldn't do anything about it. They had no weaponry. Uh, all they had to do was just wait to be slaughtered. Because of Mordecai and his intervention, the Jews were, were uh, able to defend themselves. And so here in uh, verse uh, 2 of chapter 9, the Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who were going to lay hands on them. So God worked it out so that the tables were turned and the Jews were allowed to retaliate. All of the officials and provinces and satraps, the governors and all of those doing the king's work helped the Jews. Instead of being against the Jews, they helped them because of Mordecai. You see, one of the lessons we can learn from this is that even though we may face some difficult circumstances, if we remain true to God, he always blesses. Mordecai faced some very difficult times in his life. Being a Jew, 
he was despised by a lot of the Medes and Persians, and we know what uh, Haman thought of him. And I'm sure his life wasn't easy being around there amongst the other Medes and Persians and other people in the Susan, the palace. But he remained faithful and true to God. He never wavered in his devotion to God. And now we see that he is becoming increasingly prominent. We also see that the Jews have become victorious. In the verses that follow, verses 4 and uh, through 16, we see the Jews becoming victorious. Mordecai, it says in verse 4, was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this, Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Now, Mordecai, we find in chapter 10, uh, verses 2 and 3, that he advanced because of the king's promotions. He advanced until he was the second in command to the king. He was a Jew, hated by Haman. Haman wanted to put him to death. Because of Mordecai, Haman had issued this decree to kill all the Jews. Now the tables have been turned. Haman is the one who is dead. Mordecai is being elevated. In fact, he has taken the place second only to the king Ahasuerus in the nation. God takes care of his own. Mordecai was promoted. There was an extension granted. Now, in these first verses here, uh, it tells us that the Jews have been successful. In, in fact, in that first day on the 13th, it tells us that the Jews defeated their enemies. They killed 500 men and women, children, whatever, in Shushan, the palace alone, the capital city. 500 were killed that very day. We see that in verse 12. The king, Ahasuerus, said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel. What has happened to the rest of the kingdom? And he also makes mention in here that the 10 sons of Haman were among those who were slain. And so the Jews are, are retaliating, they're, they're protecting themselves, and the king realizes that 500 of these Jews or these uh, Persians have been um, uh, put to death. And so he says, what do you want, Esther? What can I give you? What more do you want? Anything you want, you can have. So Esther says, I want another day. In verse 15, it says, uh, in, in 14, it says, or 12, I'm sorry, the king has said, what do you want? In verse 13, Esther says, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews in Shushan, just in Shushan, the capital city, that they can do again tomorrow, the 14th, what they did today. There were still some who were out to get the, the Jews in Shushan. And also, King Ahasuerus, I would like to see the ten sons of Haman hung on gallows. And the king commanded in verse 14 that it be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. And so in these verses, we see Mordecai's promotion. We see the extension granted. And now we see perishing Persians coming along. Perishing Persians. If you look at the scriptures, 500 were killed in Shushan, the capital city alone. The ten sons of Haman were killed. But it says in here, in verse uh, 10, that they did not lay hand on the plunder of those. Lest anyone think that the Jews became rich through this defense of themselves. The scripture says they took none of the plunder. They took none of the wealth of Haman's sons. They took none of the wealth of those 500 people that they uh, killed. In fact, over in verse, uh, 10, uh, verse 16, it says that they killed 75,000 Persians, Medes, people living in the province that were trying to kill them. And they did not lay hand on the plunder. The Jews didn't touch any of the riches, any of the wealth. They just left that there for the king to receive, to get, to do whatever he wanted to. They just defended themselves. They got nothing in return. Retaliation was sanctioned. The Jews were victorious. And a new feast was begun. 
In verses 17 and following, it says that on the 13th day, there was fighting. On the 14th day, there was feasting. And then a new celebration. Verse 17, this was on the 13th day. That was the 75,000 killed. On the 14th day, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Now, the Jews in Shushan were not resting on the 14th day. They rested on the 15th day. It took them two days to take care of all of their enemies in Shushan, the capital city. And that's why Esther asked for an extension. And so they rested on the 15th day and had their day of celebration and feasting. And it tells us in verses 20 and following uh, that the Jews rested, they uh, celebrated. And Mordecai in verse 20 says, as he wrote letters to all of the Jews near and far, that in verse 21, they were to establish this day, the 14th day of Adar and the 15th day, as days of celebration. These were days on which the Jews should rest from their enemies. They should feast. They should turn their sorrows into joy. And they should give gifts to one another. This was a time of celebration of joyousness because of God's handiwork and God's protection. What can we learn from Esther? I think the, the main takeaway from the book of Esther is that resentment hurts you, the one holding the resentment, much more than it hurts anyone else. We've talked about this over and over as we looked at Haman and, and followed his saga through the pages of Esther. Resentment hurts the one holding it more than it does the one at whom it is aimed. The person that you resent, the company you resent, the business you resent, whatever it may be, they are not affected nearly as much as you are as that resentment burns in your being and turns to anger and bitterness and consumes your every part being. Instead, God's way blesses you. Now, it's not easy all the time. It's not the easiest thing to do to wait for God to bring about retaliation. I'm sure it wasn't easy for Mordecai to see Haman being promoted and trading around there and doing all of these things. But, but Mordecai waited on God. Mordecai trusted God. He honored God. He waited on God, and God worked everything out for his good. You see, when we trust in God, when we honor him above all other things and put him first in our life, then he will do far exceedingly above and abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. Had you not read and known the story of Esther before we began, began this saga some nine weeks ago, would you have ever dreamed that Mordecai the Jew would one day be second only to the king Ahasuerus of the Medes and Persians? Would you have any idea that Haman, this great leader of the Persians and Medes, would one day be swinging from his own gallows? You see, my friend, we could never write a saga like this. We could never write an ending to a story like this any better than the way God did it. And I say that from experience. There have been many times in my life that things have not gone the way I wanted them to go. There have been times that I had resentment against individuals. And there have been times that I just let it go and say, okay, God, you take care of it. And when I look back over the past and I see how God orchestrated my life and led and directed in so many different ways, I am amazed at his authorship. I shouldn't be, but I am at the way he intricately wove into my life the experiences that were a blessing to me and dealt with those who were opposed to me. It's, always, it's not always easy. I don't want you to get that picture. It wasn't easy for Esther. It wasn't easy for Mordecai. But in the end, 
it came out for their betterment. It'll come out for your betterment too. If you realize resentment hurts you, God's way blesses you. Father, thank you for this simple lesson from the book of Esther that resentment and trying to get even is man's way. It's so much better to do it your way. May your blessings continue to be upon us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.